audiobook, Watson's Magazine, the official record in the case of Leo Frank, a Jew pervert, by Thomas E. Watson, audiobook narrated by John DeNugent. In New York City, there lived a fashionable architect whose work commanded high prices. He was robust, full of manly vigor, and so erotic that he neglected a handsome and refined young wife to run after little girls. As reported in the newspapers of William R. Hurst, Joseph Pulitzer, and Adolf Ox, the libertine architect had three luxurious suites of rooms, fitted up for the use of himself, a congenial company of young rakes, and the young women whom they lured into these elegant dens of vice. Stanford White's principal place, however, was in the tower apartments of Madison Square Garden. In this building, his preparations for sensual and sexual enjoyment were as carefully elaborated and as expensively perfected as the wine, women, and song were the chief end of man's existence. The excavations at Pompeii have revealed no rose door voluptuousness more oriental than that of Stanford White, like the Roman sensualist who stimulated his amorous passions by surroundings that promoted desire and prolonged the pleasure. White was artistic in his vices, and it was the nude girl, a perfect symmetry and beautiful face, that he bore into his seraglio, where rich and splendid appointments, soft lights, hidden musical instruments, fragrant flowers, and choice wines intoxicated every sense to the highest pitch of Epicurean ecstasy. Into this golden harem he took the young, lovely, and unmoral Evelyn Nesbitt, and according to her statement she was brutally used. A shocking fact in the case is that White seems to have given money to the girl's mother, and that the mother had, in effect, surrendered the maid to the man, knowing why he wanted her. Whatever the girl felt as to the manner in which White had accomplished his purpose, she soon afterwards returned to him, and their relations continued for some months. Then Harry Thaw happened to see her, fell in love with her, and ardently so desired to possess her that he married her. They went to Europe, and during the tour the wife told the young husband her terrible story. On their return to New York, the architect had the insane folly to again enter into correspondence with Evelyn, this time knowing that he had an excitable young man to encounter, a husband who might be supposed to have learned his wife's secret. All the world knows how Thaw was inflamed beyond bounds by seeing White sitting in the eating room at the garden, and how the young husband immediately shot the satyr who had doped and ruined his wife. The great legal battle that Thaw's devoted mother has waged in her boy's behalf is a part of the history of our times. For nine long years, that fine old woman has borne her cross and made her fight her son behind the bars all those bitter years. At last, after nine years of imprisonment, Harry Thaw is a free man, for the court which tried him for murder pronounced him insane, and the jury which recently tried him for insanity said that he is sane. At least one of these verdicts was correct, and both may have been, but the jurors in the last trial have since declared that Thaw ought to have killed White anyway, and about three-fourths of the red-blooded men and women of the country are of the same opinion. But the Jew-owned papers, and the Jew-hired papers, and the Hearst papers take a different view. They are outraged. Their feelings are deeply hurt. They lament the failure of the law to hang this hot-tempered boy who shot the man that had virtually bought Evelyn from her monstrous mother, and then had drugged and forced her. In their wrathful eyes, nine years' imprisonment is no punishment at all. They rail at the influence of money, and deplore the disgrace which has fallen upon New York City, the righteous town where Jacob Schiff, the banker, could give a forty-year sentence to a humble Jew for entering clandestinely the dwelling of a Jewish millionaire, the righteous town wherein the Roman priests could have the mayor assassinated without provoking hostile comment from the Hearst papers, the Jew-owned papers, or the Jew-hired papers, the righteous town where the priest Hunschmidt can cut his concubine's throat, dismember her body, fling the pieces in the river, and still 
escape punishment. Let us regale our minds by reading what the Hearst papers say about the case of Harry Thaw. It is quite true that but for the lavish outpouring of the family fortune, Thaw might have been electrocuted, or would still be confined in a madhouse. It is equally true that but for the contributions of other rich young men, whose money cursed them, his fight for liberty would not have been so prolonged or so costly. Many will moralize over the power of money, as manifested in the escape of Thaw from paying the extreme penalty for the murder of Stanford White. Fewer will stop to think of the malign power of money that pressed this rich young man along the primrose path that ended in the murder on the roof garden, his prolonged imprisonment, and the ineradicable disgrace which rests upon his name. As it is, about the most the public can say of him is to express the hope that the public mind shall not longer be assailed by the fulminations of spectacular lawyers, the imaginings of alienists, narratives note, that was an old word for a psychiatrist, an alienist, people were considered to be alienated, uh, like an alienist from somewhere else, a person who was alienated, the old meaning meant somebody who was out of their mind, their mind was somewhere else, the imaginings of alienists, and the bathos of hired pamphleteers. The world is weary of Thaw, back to Thomas Watson. The world is not weary of Hearst, fortunately, and if he can explain his prolonged hostility to Thaw and reconcile it with his determined championship of Leo Frank, the world will peruse his statement with interest. Let us now read what another New York paper, Jew-owned or Jew-hired, published about the two cases, Frank's and Thaw's. Concerning Thaw, the New Republic magazine says, In the case of Harry K. Thaw, it looks as if the state of New York had thoroughly well got its leg pulled. The state deserved it richly, for it asked a judge and a jury to decide a question which they are simply incapable of deciding. Those laymen could no more pass on Thaw's sanity than upon the condition of his liver. Thus a man may be highly educated, courteous, genial in every relation of life, and still bear within him a murderous disposition, which breaks out only on special occasions. The voluble juryman, who has been so much interviewed, came pretty close to the truth when he said that Thaw would never kill except when a woman was involved. What freed Thaw was in reality a combination of prejudices. He behaved well in court. The state's alienists, again, that's the old word for psychiatrist, behaved badly in court. Thaw fought a long fight, and men admire persistence. He had murdered Stanford White, a man who happened to be a genius, but whose genius was forgotten in the deep moral prejudice against him. The brutal fact is that an American jury is very ready to flirt with the idea that there are unwritten laws to justify the killing of men who seduce young girls. Now concerning the Frank case, the same New York City paper says, It is often too foolish to indict a whole people, but in this instance the guilt of the people is clear. They erect the only trial Frank has had. They believed every lie about him. They terrorized their public officials. They have made democracy hideous. They, the men and women of the state, narrative note, the state of Georgia, there was a minority that knew better, a minority that did not wish to make the courts of the state a vile spectacle to the whole nation. But of that minority, many were too cowardly to speak out. They allowed the mob to stamp its own imprint upon the public character of the state. The governor who acted and the opinion which supported him were not enough to save Georgia from its degradation. A people which cannot preserve its legal fabric from violence is unfit for self-government. It belongs in the category of communities like Haiti, communities which have to be supervised and protected by more civilized powers. Georgia is in that humiliating position today. If the Frank case is evidence of Georgia's political development, then Georgia deserves to be known as the black sheep of the American Union. It is a disagreeable discovery of the New Republic that American juries harbor a perverse sympathy for fathers and brothers who kill the seducers of young girls and thus rid the earth of the most dangerous vipers that crawl. The New Republic 
says that it is not only a fact that juries do sympathize with the men who give shotgun protection to womanhood, but that this fact is brutal. When the human race ceases to be capable of brutality of that sort, civilization will be the soup kettle of mollycoddles, and literature will degenerate into a milksop effeminacy that won't be worth hell's room. Coming to the Frank case, the New Republic condemns not only the jury and the judges, but the whole state in which the horrible crime was committed. Quote, it is often foolish to indict a whole people, unquote, says this magazine. Edmund Burke said it was always foolish to do so. The state of Georgia as a whole is pronounced guilty. It has had no evidence against Frank. It has been possessed of a devil of blind hatred. It is relentlessly persecuted. It has tried to lynch an innocent man under legal forms. Its mobs terrified the witnesses, terrified the jurors, terrified the trial judge, terrified the Supreme Court of Georgia in both of its decisions, the last of which was unanimous. Finally, the Georgia mob terrified the Supreme Court of the United States, which, under duress, decided that Frank's lawyers, after having had all the time, money, and opportunity needed, had utterly failed to show that Georgia had not given to Leo Frank every right to which he was entitled. What do such editors care for the calm decision of the highest court on earth? Nothing. Quote, the guilt of the people is clear. Unquote. <laughs> they have made democracy hideous. Where? When? And how? When justice was mocked in San Francisco some years ago, and William T. Sherman, afterwards the great general, narrator's note in the American Civil War, the northern general, led the, quote, mob, unquote, did the riotous tumults of an indignant democracy make it hideous? When justice was derided and defied in New Orleans, and the outraged democracy flamed into a vengeful conflagration, did it become hideous? When our revolutionary fathers lynched Tories, narrator's note, Tories refers to Americans who decided to stay loyal to Great Britain during the American War of Independence. Repeating, when our revolutionary fathers lynched Tories and drove traitors into hasty flight, did they make democracy hideous? When the commons of old England rose in bloody riots against the lords of church and state during the epoch of reform, did these insurrectionary Englishmen battling for human rights make democracy hideous? When the Athenians of old furiously fell upon and killed the Greek who advised that Grecian freedom be surrendered to the Persian king, did those rioters make democracy hideous? Away with milksops and mollycoddles! Whenever the human race degenerates to the point where intense indignation is not aroused by enormities of crime, then mankind will be ready for the last fire. And the sooner this scroll is given to the flames, as the trump of doom sounds the requiem of a dying world, the less will be the sum total of human depravity. In Georgia, there was never a mob collected while the Frank case was on trial, never a scene of tumult, never a disorder in the courtroom. It was not until after the state had patiently waited for two years, while the unlimited money back of Frank was interposing every obstacle to the law, traveling from court to court, on first one pretext and then another, offering new affidavits which soon appeared, confessedly, to have been falsehoods, paid for with money, resorting to every criminal method to corrupt some of the state's witnesses and to frighten others into changing their testimony. It was not until the people of Georgia had waited so long and seen Frank's lawyers defeated at every point by the sheer strength of the state's case against a most abominable criminal. It was not until, after all this, when one of Leo Frank's own lawyers basely betrayed the state he's referring here to Governor John Slayton, 
who was a partner in the law firm of Leo Frank's lawyers. Uh, in effect, indirectly, he by commuting Leo Frank's sentence, he was commuting the sentence of his own client, of a client of his law part, which, of course, outraged everybody in Georgia. Back to the text. It was not until after all this, when one of Leo Frank's own lawyers basely betrayed the state, upset all the courts, and violated our highest law. It was not until John M. Slayton, the partner of Leo Frank's leading lawyers, corruptly used the pardoning power to save his own guilty client. It was not until then that the people broke into a tumult of righteous wrath against the infamous governor who had put upon our state this indelible stain. And because our indignation took the same direction as that of our fathers in the days of 76, here it is, note, he means 1776, our founding fathers in the American Revolution, the same direction as that of the Frenchman who stormed the Bastille, the same as that of the Englishman who sacked the bishop's palace and the nobleman's castle, the same as that of the Viennese who rose in fury against the emperor and his Metternich, forcing that crafty and coldly ferocious old democracy hater to flee for his life. Here it is. Note this is referring to the Austrian uprising of 1848, where the people fought for their freedom and expanded participation in the government of their country, along the lines of what the Americans had done uh, decades before. Because of the fact that we Georgians are just human, we must be relegated to a San Domingo basis. San Domingo refers to the old name for Haiti, the black republic where there was voodoo worshipping and a big massacre of white people in the early 1800s. We must be relegated to a San Domingo basis and treated by other states as though we were woolly-headed worshippers of voodoo. New heading. How about Becker and New York? There is note. This heading refers to a shocking case of a New York City detective who ordered the murder of a gangster who knew facts about himself, namely that he was taking money, he was taking bribes. So the police detective ordered the murder of a gangster named Rosenthal, a Jewish gangster, a very famous case at the time. The Becker case created a profound and painful impression everywhere because of its contrast to the case of Leo Frank. The Hearst Papers, the Jew-owned and Jew-hired papers, have found this case embarrassing to them, and they are endeavoring to, quote, distinguish the cases, unquote. For example, the New Orleans Daily States says, A patient perusal of all the massive evidence, considered in the light of the clashing interests of those involved, directly and indirectly, in the Rosenthal tragedy, has left us unconvinced that the law's reasonable doubt of Becker's guilt was removed, that Becker was a police tyrant and grafter was amply proved, the fact that he was more or less endangered by Rosenthal's promised revelations of police corruption furnished a motive which made it easy for others who confessed they were in the murder plot to fasten the crime on him. But there will always be ground for the suspicion that the Rose Weber crowd framed Becker to ensure their own immunity. But whereas Leo Frank was denied the safeguards and privileges which the state pledges any person accused of a capital crime, there is no capital crime as it means a death penalty crime. Latin word caput, meaning your head, <laughs> your head coming off. Okay, repeating. But whereas Frank was denied the safeguards and privileges which the state pledges any person accused of a capital crime and was convicted in a community rank with prejudice and mob spirit and on the testimony of a vicious Negro criminal, Becker was robbed of no technical right. The law guaranteed him. Few more deliberate and cold-blooded murders have been committed in New York City than the assassination of Rosenthal, and public sentiment was powerfully exercised against Becker in the face of clear evidence that he was a grafter with a motive for sealing Rosenthal's lips. But it would be absurd to liken the atmosphere in New York during the Becker trial to that in Atlanta during the Frank trial, or to find any points of resemblance between the orderly conviction of Becker and the utterly disorderly trial of Frank. What this refers to is the fact that Becker and others were executed. Uh, Charles Becker, police officer involved in murder, he was executed. Francisco Chirofici uh, was, was the actual gunman uh, who killed Rosenthal. He was executed. Harry Horowitz, another Jew, otherwise known as Jip the Blood, was a gunman who was executed. Louis Rosenberg, Another Jew, a.k.a. Lefty Louie, 
was executed, and Jacob Seidenschneer, otherwise known as Weddy Lewis, another gunman who was executed. So uh, five people were executed for the hit on the gangster Abraham Rosenthal back then.